Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Professor Dwayne Hurd from the School of Chemistry at the University of Leeds, where I am Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry. I'm also President of the Royal Society of Chemistry's Faraday Division, which seeks to advance physical chemistry research and training. So welcome to this webinar as part of the Royal Society of Chemistry series discussing chemistry and climate change. As we look forward to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in November. So for nearly 30 years, the United Nations have been bringing together people from almost every country on earth for global climate summits. And as you'd expect, the Royal Society of Chemistry will be showing how chemistry is vital for understanding and tackling climate change through this series of online events. We will be recording this session and all our panels for those who are not able to join in real time. Please do see the rest of the program on our website by going to rsc.li forward slash COP26. Today I'm pleased to welcome an international expert panel to discuss the intersection of air quality and climate change. Poor air quality shortens lives and reduces well-being for millions of people around the world. There are many technologies that will reduce air pollution and contribute to tackling climate change, from improved cooking stoves to electric vehicles of different shapes and sizes. Our panel will provide an overview of the problem and the chemistry behind it, and how innovations in low-cost sensors and drones are improving our understanding. We'll have some time for question and answers at the end, so please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A tab, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen on the, groom, uh, on the Zoom screen. So let's get started. First of all, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Alistair Lewis, who is Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry at the University of York. In addition to teaching and research at the university, Alistair is currently a science director at the National Center for Atmospheric Science, and also he is chair of the DEFRA Air Quality Expert Group. So I'll pass over to you, Ali, to uh, start the panel proceedings. Thank you. Cool. Here we are. Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Duane. And I'm going to say a few words on some of the uh, connections between air quality and, and climate and some of the challenges that uh, policymakers and scientists and practitioners are faced in, uh, in trying to manage what are two parallel but quite closely interlinked uh, risks. And so whilst COP is gathering predominantly to discuss emissions of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in particular, um, they of course aren't the only emissions that disappear into the air. Um, there's a parallel set that are emitted that directly damage health. Uh, and these are ones that uh, we traditionally think of in the contexts of, uh, of air quality. And uh, one of the reasons that they're so significant in terms of their links with climate change is that if we can undertake actions uh, through COP that reduce greenhouse gas, and gas emissions that also reduce those air pollutants that cause harm to health. Uh, the benefits we get from reducing those that cause harm to health are immediate. So sometimes climate change mitigations seem very, very distant. They're actions that we undertake that will have benefits for future generations. But if those cuts in greenhouse gas emissions can also lead to the cut in pollutants uh, that harm health, we all feel the benefits much more quickly. And in fact, the reduction of air pollution that harms health is an important part of the economic case for, uh, for managing greenhouse gas emissions. So just to put this in context, um, air pollution is a public health issue. So that's, you know, the direct harms arising from exposure to pollution are different around the world. But even in high income countries, they sit close to the top of the list of causes of preventable uh, death. And uh, in the UK, for example, the causes of preventable death, the top five are listed uh, on the side here, with smoking still being the top cause of preventable death, but with air pollution coming in at number two, obesity number three, physical inactivity number four, and alcohol number five. So this combination of well, this constellation of risk factors is, 
uh, essentially accounts for most of the preventable illness that, that occurs in a high income country. But if we go to the global scale, uh, in fact, air pollution climbs to the top of uh, the list of preventable causes of, of, of harm and death. And this is because of very substantial concentrations and emissions in, in low and middle income countries. And you see some of the same uh, risk factors appear if you look across the globe and at a global scale, malnutrition is also another cause. So these are very, very significant impacts that, that have effects on people that are very, very similar to, uh, to well-known effects like obesity and smoking and, and, and so on. And uh, over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, we, you know, we have seen a greater appreciation of the impacts of uh, some of these risk factors on underlying population health. And it's certainly um, inarguable now that, that effectively healthier populations survive pandemics better than, than unhealthy populations. So there's a strong motivation for addressing air quality and air pollution as part of the COP reduction to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We'd ideally like to see it taken off uh, this, this list of risk factors. Now, just to put in context, there's a very long history of air pollution, and it dates all the way back to uh, the 1200s in the UK. Uh, so this isn't a new issue that we're facing, and it's really important to see where an individual country or location is on this timeline uh, of air pollution. And, and going right back to the 1200s, the issue was predominantly associated with nuisance, uh, poor visibility, and the pollution arising from burning coal which of course in many parts of the world is still a significant uh, environmental and air pollution and climate change issue. And, and um, the UK can lay claim to the first air pollution regulator, which was Edward I, who um, limited the burning of high sulfur coal, although they didn't know why that was polluting at the time. Uh, and then, of course, through the Industrial Revolution and through the UK's history around the 1950s and so on, the causes of air pollution have changed. Uh, and this is really significant because obviously in a global scale, um, the emissions climate in different countries is at different stages of development. And so some locations are still using significant quantities of high sulfur uh, fuels. They're still using significant quantities of coal, for example, in their, in their fuel mix. And so in my chronology of, uh, of the UK, we went through a period where sulfur uh, and NOx emissions, particularly from power stations, were the key issue to um, emissions from road transport being uh, a really key issue. And then we're now facing the future. And this is where the intersection of net zero and low carbon futures begins to cross over very significantly with uh, the, uh, the uh, quant quality in, uh, of air that we're going to be breathing in, in the next 20 to 30 years. So really significant in designing solutions to understand where on this chronology individual countries are and there isn't one solution or one size fits all so we have to look very carefully at the solutions that are imposed on individual companies to make countries to make sure that they fit correctly so there's a lot to learn from history and um, so this is an rsc lecture so i feel again duty bound to put some chemistry on here and perhaps the reason that it's worth doing this is to kind of underline how complicated air pollution emissions actually are and that there isn't simply one uh, emission that we need to worry about. We have a whole bunch of different pollutants that uh, are significant uh, in the context of atmospheric pollution. So for COP, it's predominantly carbon dioxide with a little bit of attention potentially on methane as being the, the key emissions. For air pollution and the ones that cause us harm, it's this three, these three here are the ones that get the most attention. These are the ones that probably do us the most amount of harm. So they're fine particles, small solids and liquids, uh, that we bring into our lungs, nitrogen dioxide or brown gas for, predominantly from high temperature combustion uh, and ozone, which is really the key gradient in, uh, in photochemical smog. So often when there's a discussion about air pollution, it's bundled together as being one thing uh, and it isn't one thing at all. It's a whole uh, range of different chemicals, each one with its own source and each one with its own set of solutions and climate mitigations that aim to address CO2 have different effects on these individual uh, air quality pollutants as well. So it gets quite complicated quite quickly. And it's really important that we break apart this description of air pollution into its component parts. So we know what actions are going to affect what pollutants and importantly, where those effects are going to take place uh, as well, because exposure to these pollutants is rather different depending on where you are. 
Most of us breathe air um, particles in no matter where we live, uh, but exposure to nitrogen dioxide is often most uh, pronounced at the roadside. So different actions have effects in different places. But atmospheric chemistry is actually quite complex and it's, it includes more pollutants than this. And we have a second tier of chemicals uh, that we really have to think about in emissions. Sulfur dioxide, for example, which is predominantly associated now with um, energy production, uh, marine emissions uh, from large shipping and so on. Uh, ammonia, which is tied very closely to other emissions from, from farming, from uh, animal waste and from the use of uh, fertilizers and agriculture. And volatile organic compounds, which are a group of pollutants that we get from solvent containing products, fuels, paints uh, and so on. And whilst carbon dioxide emissions are quite straightforward, if you burn something, you release a CO2 and it disappears off into the atmosphere. Uh, the atmospheric chemistry of this other tier of pollutants is really quite complicated. And in fact, all of these chemicals can go on and react in the atmosphere to form particulate matter. And in fact, this combination of pollutants can go on and form this one as well. So it's a very complicated interacting system. And we need to be confident that any interaction that we make in any of these individual domains is going to have impacts that are uh, ideally desirable and, and certainly ones that are not going to cause harm. And when you dig into the detail of the emissions of all of these, almost all of these pollutants are tied in one way or another to the emissions of greenhouse gases as well. So for example, the combustion uh, of fuels in cars releases both CO2 and nitrogen dioxide. Uh, the use of gasoline is tied closely to the emissions of VOCs. The production of food emits both CO2 and ammonia and so on. So there's this very, very complicated overlap of pollutants that cause harm to health with pollutants that uh, impact on climate change. And just in my final slide, we're beginning to get to grips with the mapping of this and how different emissions from different sectors and particularly how net zero as a as a, as a national and an international aspiration may play out in the domain of air quality. So this is really quite uncertain because on a lot of areas, we don't fully understand the technological pathway that we're going to follow. We don't know exactly how net zero is going to be implemented, even in individual countries, let alone at an international level. But this is an analysis from a report that's about to be published from the Royal Society uh, and this is trying to show the effects of some of the net zero actions that may uh, be imposed in a zero carbon future on the electrical supply, the transport system, agriculture and so on, and the effects that they might have on air quality as well. And uh, basically an action has a positive benefit if it sits to the right on this graph and it has a negative effect on air quality if it sits to the, net, the left. And the overwhelming uh, take home from this is that virtually everything that we do uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is likely to have a positive impact on air quality and health. And some of those benefits are unequivocal. So, for example, if you uh, remove fossil fuels and you install renewable energy instead, it's a large positive benefit on, on air quality. You remove emissions of both nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter. The same is true of nuclear power. Again, it, it has an overwhelmingly positive effect on, on air quality. Uh, slightly more nuanced situation if you use carbon capture and storage. So you can work through all of these different sectors. And if you move to transport, you can see that electric, electric vehicles are generally overwhelmingly positive for, uh, for air quality, particularly for the pollutant nitrogen dioxide. Again, there are positive benefits on things like fertilizer reduction and the reduction in meat consumption through dietary change. But there are things to think about quite carefully around reforesting and growing bio crops that if we don't do it well or we don't think through the, the, uh, the consequences of our actions could possibly have some negative impacts on air quality. So there's a lot to think about and there's a lot of chemistry in here and each of these is actually very, very detailed when you begin to look into, for example, the installation of renewable power or the installation of nuclear power and what it will displace, what the consequences uh, will be. And so the stage at the moment, I think, for a lot of areas of research is to take some of these individual areas of, uh, that are in need of mitigation of climate emissions and to work out how we can deliver the optimal solution for air quality as well. So are there ways of introducing um, uh, 
uh, that particular net zero or that particular climate mitigation that bring about the best benefits for health. And one of the most important dimensions of this is trying to deliver benefits to those locations and those people that are currently exposed to the highest pollution. So air pollution is very unevenly distributed, unlike CO2, which is pretty much the same concentration everywhere. Uh, for air pollutants that cause harm to health, it is very unevenly distributed. And overwhelmingly, the poorer you are, the higher your distribution uh, of air pollution is likely to be. And so one of the possible opportunities through decarbonisation and the move to net zero is to uh, address some of those inequalities by targeting and prioritising actions for net zero that reduce the air pollution in those real hotspots where some of the poorest in society are exposed. So it is a big opportunity here to bring together some of the issues that will be discussed at COP around uh, greenhouse gas reduction and look at those greenhouse reduction measures and then ask the question around how we can deliver optimal benefits for air quality and public health as well. So I'll stop at that point and hand back to Duane. Thanks very much, Ali. That was great. Thanks very much. Please do stay to answer some audience questions uh, later. Just a reminder to our audience, you're able to ask questions in the Q&A at the bottom tab. We'll save these for later for a broader discussion, but please do add them while our speakers are presenting. I'd like now to introduce our second speaker, who is Dr. Claudia Moore, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental Science at Stockholm University. Her main research interests are the characterization of the chemical composition of organic aerosol particles and organic trace gases by means of advanced mass spectrometric techniques. And also the investigation of their sources, formation and transformation processes in the atmosphere. So I'll now pass over to Claudia, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction, Dwayne. And I'm basically going to um, uh, start where, where Ali just stopped and um, talk a little bit, given my research background, talk a little bit about aerosol chemistry and um, international research collaborations in that regard. And Ali has shown already very nicely how aerosol particles, which is essentially uh, a bit a more broad definition of particulate matter as it involves also the gas phase around the particles, but often in air quality we talk about particulate matter when we're talking more about climate earth system effects, it's more the term aerosols that we use. And um, so I've already said it that in addition to air pollution aerosols are also important for the climate as they can either contribute to, to warming or can also have a cooling effect depending on where they are, what size they have and what they are made of. So there's really a strong connection between the air quality and the climate through aerosol particles. And um, before I go a bit more into the chemistry or the measurements of the chemical composition of these particles, I would like to make the point that when we're talking about atmospheric observations, um, which are obviously important on the one hand to understand what is happening on the planet, um, and on the other hand also to understand if we take certain measures to maybe reduce emissions, then we want to understand how those measures actually, um, what effect they have. So measurements are really important and also from a scientific point of view, they help us understand the, the earth system better. And when we're doing observations, we have often, we have a bit of a, like two approaches. We're talking about long-term observations to, to really get like climate effects and to understand how things are evolving. There's a map on the left-hand side that you can see here that shows um, the Global Atmosphere Watch network of stations around the globe. Um, some of those have been measuring for, for quite some time, and those are really important to understand what is happening on, on a global scale. And this is just one example globally, then maybe something else that I can show is just an example from 
Stockholm, the city where I live in, are like air quality monitoring stations. Those are really city stations that help us understand what air quality is doing. So th these are more long term studies that uh, that exist. And then often what we do also are more short term intensive campaigns, which then allow us researchers to really put up fancy instruments that can go much more in detail that need a lot more attention need a lot more like person power to really run them. And this is then what we more call short term in intensive observation. So both of these exist when we're talking about atmospheric observations. And one point that I would like to make here also, I think what's obvious from these maps is that they are very unequi um, un unequally distributed. And this of course has implications for our standing of how the earth system works. But it also shows a bit of a political dimension, like to say it bluntly, measurements are down there where the money is. And that means like we understand much better what's happening um, in the global north compared to the to the global south. So this is something that I would like to put out there because it has implications also for when we talk about air quality measures and, and climate measures, right? We know much more, we have much more data from certain parts of the world compared to others. And this is something that we always try to, to work on in a way. And this is an example of a project that we at Stockholm University have in collaboration with um, many other groups. Um, I will not go into too much detail here for those of you who are interested. You can read more details about the objectives of this project. But um, essentially, it really brings together different scientists from Europe and from Latin America, from different countries. And where the goal is to develop and implement an analysis and forecast system for air quality for Latin America and the Caribbean. And a very important point is the last bullet point here that's, that it, it also has an important goal of providing the basis for sustained capacity building. So ideally that we could move a bit away from focusing our measurements and our expertise in the global north and also build like capacity so that more measurements can be done in, in the undersampled regions of the globe. And um, one um, big project that we had as part of this, this popular project were measurements in Bolivia um, in, at the highest um, observation station in the world, in the Bolivian Andes at 5,240 meters. Um, we were there in December to May. Uh, 2017, 2018, so it's a while ago. And um, this station is, is of interest because it is on the one hand very high up in the atmosphere where we don't have so many observations. And at the same time, what you can see here on the right hand side, it also is fairly close to a very big metropolitan area, La Paz del Alto, like the distance is about 20 kilometers. And so there is this really interesting position where you actually are high up, but you still have influence from a big metropolitan area. So again, at this station, you can really observe this on the one hand air quality, but also on the other hand, um, parameters that are more relevant from a, from a climate perspective. And this station was started in 2009 already. So it's been measuring now for about a decade. Um, here are just some parameter that are parameters that are being measured, and those are all like just a, a yearly cycle. Um, just as an example, what there is, there's precipitation, temperature, radiation, relative humidity, wind direction from a more meteorological perspective. But then there are also compounds like black carbon, BC's black carbon, so a particulate component. Um, carbon monoxide, ozone, CO2, all these parameters have been um, recorded now for, for over a decade. So this is of course really interesting from the, from the perspective that I said before, that we really don't have so many stations in this region of the world. What we did then, those are details for those of you who are interested, but what we did in, in our campaign was then, as I said, we brought for a short period of time, a very advanced set of instrumentation, like state-of-the-art mass spectrometers that were really focusing on the chemical composition of the particles and the gases. 
to understand what contributes to the mix of, of components that we see there at this station. What, what are the influences, what are the sources, and also how does this, uh, what are the potential climate impact of, of these components. But this is something that was so like work intensive that you could only do it for a short period of time. But of course it provides a nice complement then to the, to the long-term measurements. And um, basically what, I mean, we are still working on the data, but what we are already seeing now and this also kind of confirms why we went there in a way is that we can just see really a lot of influence um, of different sources at this station. So we have, if I just start on the left hand side, we have on the one hand, like natural emissions, volcanic emissions from the, from the region um, surrounding the, the Andes. Then we have, as I said already, the influence from, from the big city of La Paz, El Alto. We also have influence from emissions from Amazon, natural emissions, biomass burning, and all of this contributes to the mix in the atmosphere that can then lead to the formation of new particles or to the growth of atmospheric particles and overall just contributes to a complex composition of particles in this, uh, in this Southern American region. And the, the small graph on the right hand side I think it is a bit hard to see, but where you see the red dots, this is where the station is. And this is a detailed analysis basically of, of air mass history, where the air masses that are impacting the station are coming from. So the, the different colors denote different locations. And then what you can basically see in a more um, quantitative way than I have just said it now is that we really have air masses from Amazon Pacific the local um, high altitude regions that are impacting the stations and really contributing to this mix of particles. And that, of course, that can then really help understand what are the processes that lead to, to the different atmospheric phenomena that we observe in this region. And um, maybe I'll add one more slide on this one in terms of this, um, the influence of air pollution also. So what you can see on the left-hand side is a time series of carbon monoxide and um, black carbon. So those are clearly emissions that are related to traffic and El Alto is a location down in the close to the city of La Paz. And um, what you can see here is that there is this Wednesday in the middle of the week where the emissions go essentially to zero. And that was a census day in, in the city. So everyone all the people were supposed to stay at home so they could, they could be counted. So there was essentially no activity out on the street. And this is when the emissions of CO and black carbon went totally to zero. So for us, this was like a clearly obvious sign that, okay, the, like whatever we have in terms of black carbon soot of, of carbon monoxide is from traffic in this city. And the lowest panel then on the left shows that this also affected the higher altitude station. Um, where we were measuring because also when there's no more emissions of these compounds from the city, they were also not observed up at the station. So this really shows that those emissions from the city can, can go up and, and really affect also the stations on top of the mountains. And then on the right hand side, just to add a bit more chemical detail, those are individual molecules related to um, to the emissions of, of toluene that are being oxidized can contribute to organic aerosol particles. And what we can could also observe even at this very like chemical detail that those compounds would really increase um, during the day there at the station. So really the pollution that we could that we could observe there. And um, yeah, I think this is where I stop and maybe I would like to add something also in terms of all the all the discussions that will now come with with COP26, we also had, we were working with a lot of students there and what was really interesting, um, their votes on how they regard air pollution and how little they can do about it, how, how little they feel like they can do about it and also how their daily lives are often much more complicated by other problems than air pollution. So for us as researchers, this was really an important point to see also like how, how people think about, about air pollution. And with that, I stop here. Thanks very much, Claudia. That was great. Um, 
so I'd now like to um, uh, just to remind you to please put questions in the Q&A at the bottom if you have questions. So our third and final speaker today uh, is Professor Neil Donoghue, who is Thomas Lord University Professor in Chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University, which is in the USA, and also Director of the Steinbrenner Institute for Environmental Education and Research. So Neil, can I pass over to you now, please? Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Duane. Uh... My introduction sometimes takes longer than my actual presentation. Let me share my screen here and try to go full. Let me know if this is showing up properly. Can you all see my that looks fine, environmental Neil. science that atmosphere? Looks fine. So, thank you. Excellent. Um, so thank you very much for uh, uh, for coming, and thank you to all my uh, co co panelists and Dwayne for. Uh, for guiding us on our way. Um, and it, among my, uh, my roles, uh, I'm honored to be the inaugural editor-in-chief of the new Royal Society of Chemistry Journal, Environmental Science Atmospheres. Uh, and I'm mostly going to reiterate uh, things that, are, uh, that, that, uh, that Ali and Claudia have already pointed out um, and actually take some examples from the first year of, uh, of published papers from our, from our new journal. Uh, and we'll point out the journal is, as it shows here, is an open access journal. Uh, and for the next uh, next while, uh, submissions to the journal are also free of, uh, of publication fees. Uh, so we are we're trying to, uh, and I think succeeding in making a world class journal that really emphasizes some of the environmental issues and connections between them, uh, and connections between location and science and policy uh, that that have already been articulated here. I will also turn on my little annotator in case I need it. Spotlight. Okay. So here, uh, as, as Ali mentioned and Claudia mentioned, uh, one of the things about uh, air pollution and, and most notably fine particle air pollution uh, is its heterogeneity. It isn't carbon dioxide disperses around the globe uh, and uh, and and the effects the effects are not felt the same everywhere, but the uh, the, the the delivery is is completely homogeneous across the planet, uh, and that is not at all true of air pollution. Um, and so even to to pick up a question that's already in the uh, in the Q and A, uh, the way that air pollution for the most part is removed from the atmosphere uh, is by interaction with the ground, and actually a great deal of it is moved removed by precipitation. And so the defining difference between what I will call traditional air pollution and, uh, and, and climate pollution is if fine particles and other pollutants are washed out typically of order in a week uh, or less. And so they will be removed relatively quickly. So going in and trying to process uh, air to remove pollutants is in my view a fool's errand. There are actually examples of attempting to do that. Xi'an China has these towers that to try to pull air through and filter it, uh, it in the open city. Um, and in my frank opinion, that, that math just doesn't add up. Uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting idea, but you deal with the pollution at the source uh, and then very quickly you see the, you see the benefits of that, um, that, that, that mitigation effort. So that's the bottom line there. So this figure is from a paper published relatively recently by Josh Apte, uh, then at the University of Texas, Austin. He's now at, uh, at, at Berkeley uh, in California, uh, and actually as part of a center that, that my colleague Alan Robinson at Carnegie Mellon runs, uh, an EPA center called the, the, the Center for Air, and Air, Climate, and Energy Solutions. So that coupling between climate change uh, and air quality is central there. Uh, and this shows the, the cumulative, the deficits, the, the, the decrement in, in life, so the year's life lost from exposure to fine particle air pollution, uh, summed up across the total population of the planet. Uh, and the bottom line here is that fine particles are removing, are killing people. Uh, they kill about 7 million people a year. Uh, but if you look at it as, as the year's life lost of an average individual, it's more than a year. 
uh, and the large countries, of course, show up uh, as the as large cuts in the in the cumulative population. So you see China and India here. The the hue of the brown here is the is is the concentration of the fine particulate matter in micrograms per cubic meter, and the darker hues are higher concentrations. And you see that much of the global south has really terrible air quality. Um, and China and India, as, as sort of emerging developed countries, uh, also have notably and famously terrible air quality, uh, whereas much of the developed world has moved along that cycle that Ali mentioned, uh, and we have comparatively cleaner air. So the coupling between pollution and, and, and climate is, is a big deal, as we've already mentioned. This is a photograph I took many years ago now, looking down the Rio Negro at Manaus, and there happened to be this developing um, cumulonimbus thunderstorm towering 15 kilometers into the atmosphere. We watched it grow as we headed down the river. Um, it's not necessarily there because it's over the city, but the, the coupling between uh, the natural atmosphere and, uh, and urban emissions is, is uh, often especially of interest in, in places like Manaus in the developing world. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to emphasize is just the role of different parts of the world and climate change, because this is a discussion related to the uh, to, to the IPCC report and the and the COP uh, uh, meeting in coming up in Glasgow. And so this figure shows projections of climate change with attribution uh, over uh, up until the the year 2100. And the blue range is the developed world, uh, orange is China, green is India, and the rest of the world, the the global South. Uh, the, the developing countries in the rest of the world of this purple range here, and this is degrees C on, on the, the, the y-axis here. Uh, and right now, uh, essentially all of climate change, 75% of climate change is attributable to emissions from the developed world. Um, a lot of it, the United States, uh, and, and relatively little is from, the, from the, the rest of the population of the planet. And even by 2100, only 25% or so of of climate change would be attributable to the global south, um, assuming business as usual development. And another scenario, uh, I won't go into the details of the scenarios, but that involves decarbonization uh, would, would be a trajectory like this. This is something that gets you very close to two degrees uh, C of, of uh, warming. It's very hard to get less than two degrees C in scenario development, but this involves decarbonization from the developed world that starts right now. Uh, and aggressively at about 10% per year with further on down the road, decarbonization in China, India, and then the rest of the world along with sustainable energy development. Uh, and so that coupling again is, is central here. The bottom line of all of this, just to put the bottom line out immediately, um, the most important feature of carbon dioxide is that it lasts effectively forever. The climate effects of carbon dioxide emissions uh, will will continue for 100,000 years until the ocean eventually manages to dissolve some carbonate rock due to increased acidity and rebuffer itself. Uh, so the, 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 the climate consequences, unless we go and we do active air capture, direct air capture of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is gonna last forever. And essentially the warming is about a 400th of a degree C per gigaton of carbon emissions from of carbon dioxide. And we're emitting 10 gigatons per year right now. So that's a 40th of a degree per year or a quarter of a degree per decade of warming. Remember two degrees is the, uh, is the target, one and a half degrees is the aspiration um, as of uh, previous COP meetings. Whereas those combustion derived particles are going to be swept out in a week and have very local effects. And again, the, the source is, is broadly the same. It's combustion, and a lot of it is combustion of fossil fuel, though not all of it. So those local benefits are the big deal. And the local harm, especially in the developing world, is enormous. And one way economists like my colleague Nick Muller uh, at Carnegie Mellon can monetize that. Um, and it's not something we typically do, and that is a big... Uh, mistake in terms of policy, in my opinion, because the benefits of air, air pollution mitigation, like Claudia was talking about, are enormous. Uh, so in, in, in the context of the United States economy, over periods of time, even some that were regarded as sort of downturns, uh, recessions, we were seeing a full point in economic growth if you added in the avoided or reduced gross environmental damage from air pollution. And that's just 
the air pollution mortality, not any other environmental consequences of emission. So identifying in the diverse uh, pool of emissions from the, from the global source south, the, the, these co-benefits is just a critical issue. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that and then we can stop and, and, and take, take general questions. Some of these are from the global south, some of these are from, from other sources, but we're looking at the, the full suite of instrumentation that we can use. So yes, as atmospheric chemists, all of us love to take all of the expensive kit we have uh, and, and, and pour millions of, of dollars or pounds of effort into intensive research. Uh, in at, in uh, wherever we you know wherever we go with our with our kit where we can find funding, but developing low cost sensors that we can deploy uh, around the world that that can that 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 local scientists can deploy around the world uh, in multiple no locations continuously monitor air pollution and the benefits of of specific interventions is a big deal. Uh, and so my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, um, Subu, and Albert Presto have developed. This thing they call a ramp, uh, and you know, real-time air, air pollution uh, monitor. Uh, the gray boxes here are more expensive mobile laboratory in the back, and we have a campus at in Kigali, Rwanda, uh, and and Subu's deployed a number of the ramp sensors there, along with another colleague, pa Paulina Haramio. And this is an example again of a little bit like that census day, where where Kigali has car-free Sundays, uh, and. And the blue dots are the, the pollution level, the fine particle air pollution level. This is a one full day, the diurnal average of all of these days. The red dots are normal Sundays. And by having a car-free Sunday, you see, first of all, you see the air pollution levels are very high. 50 micrograms per cubic meter is, is high air pollution. And secondly, you see that, that in this case, traffic is a significant source, but it's by no means the only important source of air pollution in Kigali. So seems to make some sense. I mean, that's cutting about 7%, I believe, is the average deficit, especially early in the day. This is a classic diurnal variation from, uh, from, from especially from traffic in the morning rush hour here at about seven o'clock before the boundary layer thickens, and then the boundary layer thickening dilutes the pollution and it builds up overnight. So we teach this as textbook stuff in, in air pollution. Uh, classes. Uh, but that's a, an example of how the low-cost sensors can, can help. Another thing that, again, done by Albert, uh, Rebecca Tanzer, uh, uh, one of his PhD students, the pandemic is, has been one of these uh, natural experiments that, uh, that, of course, we can use to see. In the case of Pittsburgh, uh, the lockdown involved an almost complete cessation in, in commuter traffic. Uh, but we did continue that we, we we're a legacy post-industrial city. Um, but uh, we do have a large industrial coke facility and other industry remaining. And so these figures show the dash curves are kind of the normal observations from these ramp sensors. And then the, the solid curves, the black one is near uh, uh, industrial sites, including the uh, large industrial coke facility. And then the blue curve is in high traffic areas that are not in industrial areas. And you see the traffic is essentially vanished. Whereas, in the, whereas the industrial emissions retain that kind of classic diurnal cycle. Uh, and so again, we can begin to piece uh, and pull out the individual contributions, not just from inventories, but from actual observations. And that sort of measurement is crucial to figuring out which interventions in, in, in the very diverse emissions uh, framework of the developing world and the global south are gonna be effective at reducing air pollution and reducing uh, the, the uh, the climate emissions, uh, and and as Ali was talking about, air pollution is a is a is a in a, a very rich cocktail, uh, and and the subsequent chemistry of those air pollutants is what we thrive on as atmospheric chemists. And so this is some work from the from the group of uh, of our colleague Federico Bianchi, um, who was also heavily involved in those Bolivia experiments uh, at the University of Helsinki, um, looking at the Po Valley uh, during the lockdown. And in this case, you see nitrogen dioxide uh, uh, traceable to vehicles um, went down significantly for the same reasons that the fine particles went down in Pittsburgh. Uh, but the ozone went up. And this has been seen now in a number of cities around the planet from, uh, from, the, uh, from the, the, um, uh, the, the lockdown. But the fine particles went down only a little bit. 
Uh, so again, that's something we can do with these with these sensors. So just a couple more things, and we'll wrap up for some some questions. Other these are these are papers, by the way. Fede's paper here is the the the, the red ones are from our journal. Um, so so a, a another paper from the group of Marco Kulmala at the University of Helsinki uh, is using distributed low cost sensors uh, this time in uh, uh, in Nanjing in China uh, to look at the. Uh, the, 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 the sources uh, and the effect of street canyons and also trees in, um, in the local air quality. Uh, and this did work through the lockdown as well, but the main uh, conclusions had to do with the, with the correlations between uh, high densities of trees in the, in the city in different places and the, uh, and, and the local air quality there. Um, also, uh, with the lockdown, um, and this is this is some work from from the the Chinese Academy of Science, again published in our journal. Uh, you can actually see that climate effect, and so looking at the relationship between aerosol optical depth and uh, also the, the the actual diurnal temperature cycle uh, with uh, with the um, with the lockdown showed a very significant change in the, it got, the, the diurnal cycle got, got larger because air pollution haze sort of uh, intercepts the surface warming that drives warming during the day in that classic diurnal cycle I was talking about. And with distributed sensors, one can see that. So finally, going back to the Amazon and, and, and opening up for questions, uh, the last part of this is that, uh, that one can deploy uh, drones uh, and low-cost drones with, in this case, with with cartridge samplers to measure organics. This is the this is the Amazon forest. That's a little drone uh, that was that was uh, deployed by by a graduate student in Scott Martin's group at Harvard. And measuring the emissions from the from the forest, uh, we can then model those emissions and their contribution to air pollution in a seemingly pristine area like the Amazon rainforest. So remember the wind comes from the east uh, in the tropics. Here's Manaus on this map uh, and the plumes from the sulfur dioxide emissions in Manaus combining with those organics from the Amazon lead to high, high concentrations of fine particle number, uh, which is what the colors are proportional to, whereas the blue is essentially pristine air to the east of Manaus and also fires in the in the region are our major contributors to those fine particles again a consequence of human activity so that's some of the ways that we can measure uh and and we are also trying to 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 enable measurements across the world to unravel the complicated sources of fine particle pollution and the coupling to climate change around the planet so with that i will stop and give it back to duane uh to manage questions thank you very much neil that was great um, so we have a question in the chat um, from Kathy. Thank you. Is there a way of removing pollutants from the air or is the reduction of air pollution purely about reducing emissions at source? I think uh, Kathy here is drawing parallels with carbon capture technology where you can re remove carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere. So Neil touched on this. Maybe I'll just pass over to Ali just to comment on this question, please. Thank you. Uh, well, I think Neil said it. I mean, outdoors, it's possible, but grossly inefficient um, compared to removing them before you emit it. There's this analogy that it's far easier to not put milk in your coffee than to take the milk out after you've added it. So uh, there are methods, but I think they're never going to be energy efficient. Um, but it might be possible indoors. And there has been a growth in indoor air filtration. Um, it was happening before COVID, but obviously in enclosed environments, there is a possibility to to clean the air because it's a much more constrained uh, volume. There are other issues associated with cleaning air indoors, um, particularly around the inequality of it. It basically only affords clean air to people that can afford air cleaners and the electricity to power them. But that's a slightly different question. So I would say outdoors, really not feasible. Indoors, possibly yes. Thanks very much, Ali. Um, I'd just like to move on to Claudia now. Um, clearly, we've got the COP conference coming up you know in a month or so i was wondering if you had any priorities for governments to cooperate internationally on climate change and the issues around air quality what would you like to see happen from this event yeah let's see if anyone listens right <laughs> um no i think like i might have hinted at that already in my presentation that i think it's 
obviously a highly political discussion. And I think it doesn't work without a discussion on like global justice and equality. I think from my perspective, this it, it all comes down to that because right now, like who is polluting and who is suffering from it is, is grossly like not distributed in any way like equally and like I think having this discussion for me is is by far the most important thing and I think it's the only way where the only way where whatever measures we take will be will be effective like taking global justice into account basically. Okay, thank you. I'm just wondering if the other two panelists have something to add to that question. So, Neil, what would you like to see coming out of the event? Yeah, I, I, I second what Claudia said, and, and specifically, <clears throat> the, I mean, first of all, the air pollution, because of the, the climate change is, is uh, immortal. Um, I, I'm, that's why I showed that, that blue swath. It is on us. Um, so the, this, this is something that's faced climate negotiations for decades now is that the, uh, the developing world has recognized and stressed this, that, that the developed world has to not only take leadership, but responsibility for what we've already done. Um, and one of the mechanisms to do that would be to, uh, to formalize you know, what you might call a global green investment bank. I don't care what the title is, but, but when, when you look at interventions that, would lead, that, that are decarbonized, uh, so very low carbon sustainable energy development and other development, uh, I mentioned Paulina Jaramillo at, at Carnegie Mellon has looked at this for Rwanda, uh, and it is more expensive. So it, at the actual sticker price of, of zero carbon electrification, for example, costs more money. But uh, when you do this sort of economic analysis, you say, well, yeah, but the, the avoided mortality, and again, taking Rwanda as an example, uh, would be significant. Um, but that that's an additional, that's if you, that, that depends on the, the, essentially the price of life, the value of a st statistical life and realizing that benefit isn't straightforward at all uh, without incentives for, for a developing country. And so providing the investment to say, okay, um, any infrastructure project, uh, the additional cost, because they, they are, they're sort of a dime on the dollar kind of additional cost. It's not enormous. So any uh, project like that, uh, that additional cost to decarbonize it and make it sustainable will be provided. That's what I would do if I were emperor, which you Thank don't you. want. Ali, did you have something to add? What would you see as a priority out of COP26? Well, I agree with everything that's been said, but I mean, it's pace. It's pace of change. That's the thing that really matters now. Um, as Neil said, we, we're going to live with the consequences of everything that's emitted now for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds thousands and thousands of years so you know the quicker you get on with it the less you accumulate so, so I think I would be less concerned about having a pet sector that I would want to work on I think if you could go for one thing it's it's the speed of the commitments uh, and the speed with which countries are going to commit to implementing that's that's the really crucial thing that's got to come out of COP. Okay thanks very much. Gloria, if, if I can ask you a question, you talked about people working together in your talk. Um, how do you think researchers can best work together with, with industry to, to minimize air pollution and create a more stable climate, perhaps through technology innovation, for example? Yeah, I guess in the end, it's, we just have to get together and talk together like we have for example here in Stockholm we have something called the clean air network that was initiated by um, the Royal Institute of Technology so another university and this basically brings together like researchers and then local businesses who deal with in one way or the other with all kinds all things related to air quality indoor outdoor and we meet fairly regularly and discuss like research projects and what could be done and the companies like give their statements on what they are interested in. And I think this is incredibly informative and we learn so much from each other because obviously as scientists, we think totally differently from people who run a company. And I think something that we or that has struck me also is how important it is for companies to have like reliable legislation like essentially they need to know what will be the next measures made by the governments when will they come out when do they when can they or when do they have to adapt to the new measures something like 
this for them is, is really crucial that they can rely on on when the next regulations will come out and that it will be you know like not just random and and out of the blue so this seems to be something very important adding the political dimension here as well thank you neil in in your talk you talked about drones and small sensors and things um what are you most optimistic about in terms of trends in technology and society in general that might you know, improve the situation dramatically with regard to air quality, specifically air quality, which is what you talked about quite a bit? I guess I'm most op optimistic that it is it's highly feasible. Um, and so with, as Claudia said, that the, the regulation structure is incredibly important, but at this point, we, you know, we can and know how to do it. And so we know that that, that knowledge transfer, um, not just from science to industry, but from, uh, you know, engaging uh, colleagues on the ground uh, locally uh, in, in, in the global south, it's, it's doable. What we cannot do is have Every country follow the you know the tried the the way that that uh, that Manchester did it the way that Pittsburgh did it the way that China has done it to essentially pollute and mitigate and to do that in air pollution and to do that in climate change because we know better now um, and so I I actually it's a it's a uh, I have a colleague who says it's a matter of will it's not um, it's not really a matter of the technology at this point. Thanks very much, Neil. I think a lot of people listening to this might think, you know, what can I do um, you know, myself to improve the situation you know, as an individual? And we've got a question actually in the Q&A from Fiona. And so I'd like to ask each of the panelists, um, what is one single simple thing that the panelists recommend everyone could do to help improve air quality and reduce greenhouse gases? So maybe I could start with Ali on that one. So it's a hard one to answer because everybody's lives are different. And I'm always a bit dubious about kind of giving advice because um, the advice that you give could be completely inappropriate for the person that you're giving it to. I mean, it's unquestionable if you live in a high income country, probably not flying is the single biggest thing that you could do um, that would reduce CO2. But, but in a way, that's a bit of a cop out. That is an optional extra in a lot of people's lives. Um, you know, we have to push to try to get lower carbon energy sources, whether it's for our cars or um, it's how we power our homes. And, you know, in the end, that's us as consumers having to push for those choices, even if it costs more, you know, it adds a penny or two onto the cost of doing it. So, um, yeah, I, I think if you can have a lever to make a low carbon choice around energy supply. I mean, I would do that and I would probably fly less if I was a person that already flied, uh, flew a lot. But uh, it is a hard one. Everyone has to kind of do their own audit, I think, before they come up with an answer. Thank you, Ali. Claudia, could you add your suggestion, please? Yeah, I totally second what Ali says. I, I have a hard time preaching, especially because me, my, I myself, are, I'm far away from being perfect. So I really think like having a good look at your life and then trying to figure out where you can, you know, reduce emissions as much as possible. That's probably the way to go, I would say, because it's hard to just give someone like advice in this sense. I, I really think like maybe also as a scientist, I think like check your numbers, check what you are emitting in what aspect of your life and then try to work on that, I think. Thank you, Claudia. Neil, it's getting harder. Now the third panelist, what's your suggestion? I, I'll go back to, to my upbringing in the 1960s, think globally, act locally. Uh, and actually, I think that a lot of what we've been saying in this panel is consistent with that. I mean, that's one of the things that the coupling between air pollution and climate change brings is so local the, you know if, if reducing uh, eliminating fossil carbon uh, combustion has this huge it's what we must do for climate and by doing that you know in my city a couple hundred 250 people die every year at least from air pollution uh, and that'll go away um, it's a little it's 
more complicated in the developing world, but uh, but local action does have an effect. Thank you. We're getting close to the end now, but I want to just ask one final question to Ali. Um, so we hear people talking about a climate emergency, but are we also in an air quality emergency? And if we're not, what's the difference between the two? Uh, I would say that there is an emergency in, in both of them. And I don't like it actually when we're asked to kind of weigh the two up and say which one is the more important of the two. Both of them are critically in, important. And I think for, for air pollution, you know, we are beginning to understand now that it is a drag on public health in just the same way as obesity is a drag, smoking is a drag, physical inactivity is a drag. Um, and once we know that, we should be empowered to do something about it. And um, it's something that we can do something about now. And I think when you stress healthcare, as we've all been through in the last 18 months, I think it brings it into sharp focus that if only we were slightly healthier, if only we'd got to grips with some of these drags on public health a bit earlier, we would have potentially have got through the last 18 months uh, a bit a bit better. So um, yes, I think it is an emergency. It's an emergency in lots and lots of low and middle income countries where it really is a critically debilitating component um, of life. Um, so, uh, but I don't want to, if you like, weigh it up against climate change because they're both absolutely vital. And I think, you know, the main thing is to stress that there are potentially solutions to both of them lying in the same place. Thanks very much, Ali. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time now. There's lots of facets and questions we could discuss for a while, but I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. So I'd like once again to thank all of our panelists today for their contribution and thank also you for watching. And then finally, just to remind you that you can find more Royal Society of Chemistry discussions around the UN COP26 programme on the Royal Society of Chemistry's rep, uh, website, which is rsc.li forward slash COP26. Or you can go onto the social media channels of the RSC. So anyway, just like to thank you all very much for coming today. Thank our panelists again, and please do join us for further webinars in this series. Thank you very much.